tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 6, Episode 16. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In this episode, I'll be performing four spine-chilling tales, a hand-picked collection pulled from the pages of the January 1943 edition of the iconic American fantasy and horror fiction pulp magazine, Weird Tales, the very same publication that gave writers such as H.P. Lovecraft and Clark Ashton Smith their starts, and which inspired generations. Tonight's featured authors may not be household names, such as Shirley Jackson and Bram Stoker, and may have been lost since leaving this mortal plane, but their tales, though largely lost to the sands of time, will be given you life today by yours truly. If I have anything to say about it, their ideas will live forever, and I sincerely hope you enjoy hearing the tales as much as I've enjoyed telling them. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscurrypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So, lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes to us from author August Derleth. In it, we'll meet a magician who discovers a sure way of seeing into the past and future and wishes he hadn't. Perhaps it's better not to know what's ahead, but could you resist taking a peek into a telescope that shows the future? Without further ado, I present to you McElwin's Glass. Aldrich McElwin, who was part Irish and part Welsh, had been born with a call. His mother had always made a great to-do about this, and it was assumed that he would, of course, be something special in the world because of that fortuitous circumstance. A great man of some kind. The call may have been subconsciously responsible for the choice of McElwin's way of life. He elected to follow the path of the great Thurston, Houdini, and others. He became a magician on a vaudeville circuit and made a moderate success of it. For a man born with a cowl, he certainly had to bear with a great deal. He was short, fat, with reddish, thin hair and somewhat distorted features. He was an impatient man and no blessing of tact was his. But he managed to get along, comparatively adventureless, carving out a small niche for himself until he came by the telescope. 
One day in Chicago, he passed a curious little hole-in-wall kind of shop, antiques and curios, and went in. He came out with a telescope, presumably the victim of an unclaimed pawn ticket. But he had something, and he was not long in discovering it. The telescope was extraordinary in that it had some kind of magical glass in it that enabled its possessor to look backward or forward in time. He discovered this by the simple expedient of looking through his glass. At the moment he had it turned upon a building in that area of the city where once, more than a century ago, Fort Dearborn had stood. And there he saw, instead of the building visible to his naked eye, a band of Indians besieging the fort. He went through all the emotions customarily associated with the occurrence of phenomena not within the scientific knowledge of the average man. But he was too practical to fail to see, presently, that his telescope had a great value to him in a commercial sense. Away with ledger domain and the poppycock of appearing on a stage with fancy little tricks to mystify his audiences. He had something bigger up his sleeve. Forthwith, he took a large slice of his savings and set himself up in the fortune-telling business. He had long envied palmists, crystal gazers, numerologists, and the like, their skill in separating fools from their money. With a telescope like this, he could do a land office business. His first victim was the policeman on the beat. He caught him in the focus of his glass one day and foresaw that he would be advanced in position and salary within four weeks because of an act of great bravery. He reported this gravely and without charge to the law, and two weeks later, Ryan was indeed promoted in reward for capturing a small-time thief who came bearing down on him, waving a gun. There was no great shakes, said Ryan, telling McKelwin about it later. But what beats me is how you could tell it that far in advance. The word went around. The grateful Ryan spread it as far and wide. McKelwin had known he would. And in a few days, people began to come to have their fortunes told. Then it was McKellen discovering that his glass had a most annoying idiosyncrasy. It did not work all the time, that is, with everyone. Indeed, it appeared to work most haphazardly, so that he had to resort to the cheapest kind of trickery to give any satisfaction as a fortune teller. He couldn't understand it. Moreover, the glass failed to reveal everything. That is to say, he could visualize in it the future only by successive steps, not as an unfolding canvas. And there was, too, the occurrence of strange blanks. For instance, his glass one day revealed Ryan in hot pursuit of someone, by train it seemed, but the object of his search was not revealed, though once or twice it seemed, by all the laws of perspective, that he should have been within sight. The glass responded most unsatisfactorily also when Miss Yvonne Carson came for a sitting. This young lady, who was destined to be the heir of a considerable amount of filthy lucre in cash and securities, was endowed with a great deal of physical charm. She was not a ravishing beauty, to be sure, but she had something more than the hint of the long green about her. Not unnaturally, McKelwin was possessed of an overwhelming interest in her. Thus, his disappointment was all the greater when he first saw in the glass that she would be married quite suddenly. He could see many of the details of the ceremony, nothing elaborate, apparently an elopement, but like the man Ryan was pursuing, he could not make out the fellow she was marrying. Indeed, it was as if she stood there in the glass before the preacher with only a space in the shape of a man beside her. Extraordinary. He bluffed his way out of her first sitting. For, of course, she came back for more. McKelwin was not an unattractive man, and he made no secret of the fact that Miss Carston was definitely attractive to him. 
and by this time, too, he could put on quite an appearance of wealth himself. He actually began, within a short while, to think that the fellow in the glass, the invisible fellow, Yvonne was marrying, would have to hurry onto the scene if he meant to be on time. Oh, vanity, vanity. Soon, McElwin knew no check on his self-esteem. He was bound to have a setback, however, though, unfortunately for him, he did not recognize it when it came. It was in the person of a nondescript little man who appeared one day on the doorstep, garbed in clothes which men of modest means might have worn circa 1750. It was an extraordinary person, given to statements of the most astonishing nature. He introduced himself as a distant relative of McElwin's, with the same name, so distant, in fact, that he was several generations removed. I had a son who fought at Fort Dearborn. It had come about McElwin's glass. The fact is, the telescope was stolen from my house in the country, south of Chicago, and I want to get it back. I've traced it here, and I'm perfectly willing to pay an adequate fee for its return. It's my livelihood, said McElwin sentenciously. I couldn't think of selling it. I fail to see how it could be your means of making a living, said the ancient, his lies puzzled. I tell fortunes, answered McElwin. The old man was even more puzzled. He wrinkled up his forehead and peered at McElwin with the utmost curiosity. Can it be, he mused, that you are not aware of the peculiar properties of the glass? McElwin grinned. How do you think I could make my living with it if I weren't? But the ancient still could not understand. With patience and some manifest scorn, McElwin told him, But there's one thing more that dealer should have told you, said the old man then. And that is this. The telescope is effective only when the scene or person whose past or future it portrays is associated with its possessor. Nonsense, said McElwin. What about that Indian scene? My son was in that battle. Coincidence. Tell me, what have you seen? McElwin obliged with a great air of personal pride, as if he had accomplished these miracles in divination by his own efforts alone. While they spoke, telling of Ryan and Yvonne and one or two others among his successes, the old man's frown grew darker and darker, and presently his manner grew curiously agitated. He manifested some nervousness, but by the time McElwin had finished, he could only shake his head and purse his lips. I must say I don't approve, he said flatly. Furthermore, I don't like the nature of those things you've been seeing. I can understand, however, why you wouldn't want to part with the glass. In view of the circumstances and my desire to get it back, I wonder if you would mind much leaving it to me in your will. Since it was manifest to any observer that the operation of the laws of nature would remove the ancient McElwin from the sphere of existence, long before the younger was called, barring incident. McElwin made a ready ascent, patiently took down all the data offered by his elderly relative, a relative which the old man seemed to prove, however circuitously, and bade him good afternoon. Two days later, he received a letter from the ancient containing complete directions for the care of the telescope, together with information about shipping it to him, after McKelwin's death. It was fully as extraordinary a document as the ancient had been an individual. There was a curious little footnote appended to the letter. If you thought about what you have seen at all, surely it must have occurred to you that the course you are following is, to put it very bluntly, a very unhealthy one. I suggest more urgently that you leave matters in your life stand just where they are, Send the glass back to me and forget your present pursuits, particularly Miss Carston and Inspector Ryan. What pretensions the old duffer had, thought McElwin, destroying the letter. 
He didn't follow the old man's most obvious hint to think about the revelations of the telescope. Beginning with the Fort Dearborn scene, there had been a singularly odd relationship among the scenes and persons about whom the telescope had been revelatory. It was unfortunate that McElwain was viewing them, so to speak, rear and foremost, and could not, therefore, be in the proper perspective. Even if he had opportunity to consider what he had seen, he was by this time far too much gone on Ivan Karsten to give any unnecessary thought to the telescope. For, extraordinary and incredible as it might seem, Miss Karsten had very definitely shown a distinct liking for McElwain, to such an extent that they were being seen together for luncheon, at the theater, at flower shows and dog shows, and the races, a great life. McElwain found less and less need to turn to his magic glass. He forgot all about his ancient relative, the telescope's previous possessor, and proceeded to enjoy himself. Yvonne was a woman of great charm in various devious ways. She was not so devious, however, that it was not manifest that she intended to have McElwain for her own, one of those masterful women. There were the signs in plenty, but unfortunately McElwain had not had enough experience to recognize them. Moreover, he was at that stage where a score of red flags and a dozen skull and crossbone labels would not have deterred him at the least. In a position like that, there was only one possible outcome. One evening, when Yvonne was being especially coy and feminine, she archly proposed that they ought to elope. They were made for each other and so forth. Since this was a consummation in McElwain's mind, devoutly to be wished, it was no sooner said than done. Off they went to a little county preacher over in Iowa, and there they were made man and wife. Only one thing served to mar the joy of the occasion, and that was the persistent, if ridiculous, conviction that it had all happened somewhere before. Since McElwain was not a believer in reincarnation, he managed to shrug his feeling away with no great effort whenever he concentrated on the heavenly bliss of being forever now at Yvonne's side and within reach of her wealth. They had hardly got settled before Inspector Ryan called on them to offer his congratulations. Incidentally, he explained, he came for another reading by means of McElwain's glass. McElwain got it out, dusted it off, and performed. The telescope revealed that Inspector Ryan would soon be assigned to the Homicide Squad, and that very shortly after his assignment, he would be put in charge of a very startling murder. Do I catch the murderer? Ryan demanded. Well, I don't know, replied McElwain. I don't see that. I see a chase, a train, a chase through a train. They're a murderer, and I can't make him out at all. Just a shape, that's all. Jumps off the train, and that's the end of him. Looks like water below. Well, I can recover the body, Ryan consoled himself. Good luck, grinned McElwain. If Ryan had come a week later, he would have stepped into an entirely different household. It was the old story all over again. Now that he had McElwain, Yvonne began to look upon him as another property, her riches had brought her, and she began slowly to treat him like property. McElwain had his pride, and he rebelled. They had several scenes. First, it was the telescope. It ought to be put away, she maintained. It was out of keeping with the decorations and the furniture, and anyway, he didn't have to use it anymore. Reluctantly, McElwain put away his glass. Some obscure impulse impelled him to pack it carefully, in accordance with the remembered instructions from his strangely ancient visitor, and put the label on it, the address which would take it to a house in the country south of Chicago. Then it was the way McElwin dressed, the way he ate, the way he acted, the way he did almost everything. Yvonne revealed herself an ardent reformer at heart, and something of a 
term agent. The increasing tempo of these experiences was not pleasant for McElwin, and not at all good for his disposition. A year passed, a year of constant torture for McElwin. It was apparent that he could do very little to please his wife, and it was also apparent that he was not going to get his hands on any of her long green, not a cent of it. He was put on an allowance scarcely sufficient for his needs, and there he was, a caged lion, at heart at least, being hand-fed and led around by a silver chain, so to speak. It was galling, it was humiliating, it was infuriating. But whenever he thought of his wife's wealth, McElwin swallowed his pride. A painful process, but it could be done. Unfortunately, however, it could not be done forever. One day, McElwin got out the telescope and focused it on his wife just walking out to her car. What he saw gave him cold chills. It was nothing less than Yvonne dead, lying somewhere with a hole in her head. He put away the glass with horror. However, after he got over the chills... He was curiously surprised to find that the prospect of losing McElwin was not too displeasing. He could have spent the rest of his life with the uh, Yvonne he had known before the marriage, but now, heaven forbid. So he settled himself to wait until someone reported that Yvonne had been killed in an accident and was cruelly jolted when she walked in in the flesh and immediately began to berate him for not having attended to the Forsythia bushes in the absence of the gardener. For a week, he could not think of his magic telescope without an acute feeling of displeasure, and he did not go near it except to pack it all over again and consign it mentally to that other, older, McElwin. By an odd coincidence, he had no sooner committed the glass in his mind to his curious relative then a note came from the old man in the next mail. A note to thank him for the glass, which he would expect shortly. I am grieved that you did not heed my well-meant advice, but is that not always life? Indeed it is. The older generations must always sit back and see how the benefit of their experience is carelessly discarded and realize that when at last that benefit becomes apparent, there will only be this for youth to say. Too late. Indeed, and so it is with you, Aldrich, already too late. Aldrich almost regretted having been so hasty as to pack the glass for the old man, but he was only too occupied with Yvonne's latest displeasure to do anything about it. McElwin's patience was wearing very thin indeed. He had borne just about all that was meant for man's patience to bear, and he had began to snap back at Yvonne. This was a novelty for Yvonne, and she did not like it, not at all. In fact, she grew more demanding and domineering than ever, and loaded onto his back enough straws to have broken the backs of several camels, even though the thought of all of her wealth was no longer holding McElwin down. The break came less than a year and a half after their wedding. It would have been the sensible thing of McElwin to have walked out on Yvonne before this, but he was not built to think that way. The obvious solution would never have occurred to him. It had been the same way about the magic glass, about his relative's straightforward warnings. Nothing doing. Leave it all to impulse. It was unfortunate for Yvonne, that she had chosen that morning to nag at McElwin. She did not exist long enough to know how unfortunate it was. The fact was, McElwin had just finished cleaning a little target pistol when Yvonne walked in and began to berate him in that dictatorial way of hers for an incident so trivial that McElwin had long before forgotten it. He strove desperately to remember what it was about and in the process of casting his mind back, he resurrected from memory all the disagreeable experiences to which Yvonne had subjected him. Memory overwhelmed him. Something inside him snapped. 
he raised his pistol and shot her. A neat round hole in her head, and what was the end of all of her nagging? What good did her money do her now, or her nagging either? For those brief moments after she fell to the floor, he was glad. Then, of course, panic caught up with him. Within an hour, he was on his way out of the city. He took a taxi to the northwestern station, on his way to hide out in the north woods of Wisconsin, remembering in some mental confusion that Dillinger had once hidden out successfully there, and convinced he could do likewise. Unfortunately, the taxi was involved in an accident, and there was a delay that seemed interminable. He had to give evidence to the cop on the beat, and he all the time on tenderhooks. But his taxi was allowed to go on at last, and he caught his train. Out of the city at an agonizingly slow pace, he thought. But out they went, and no one could know him in that crowd. They crossed into Wisconsin in the darkness. It had already been dusk when the train left Chicago. And at Madison, he bought a paper. There was Yvonne's picture, not yet, thank the Lord, one of his, and noticed that he was being sought for questioning by the police. But it was the last line of the brief, stop press account that caught his eye. Inspector Ryan of the Homicide Squad is in charge. Dimly, incredibly, the meaning of what that ancient relative, the one-time owner of his glass, had told him began to seep, into his paralyzed brain. The telescope is effective only when the scene or person whose past or future it portrays is associated with its professor. Yvonne, he had married her. Ryan, on his trail. In the darkness of the moving train, he found in his mind's eye that strange, faceless shape he had seen in his magic glass, that shape at Yvonne's side, eluding Ryan's pursuit, but now it had a face. It had a recognizable body, the face and body of Aldrich McElwain. His thoughts jumped to that last scene with Ryan, on a train, in flight from pursuing Ryan. But it could not be true. Ryan could not be on the train. McElwain was not without courage. He got up and went the length of the train and back, to assure himself that Ryan was not on it. The inspector was nowhere present, and there was no sign of official doom anywhere. He went back to his coach and tried unreasonably to sleep. Of course, he could not. He could not get out of his mind's eye that picture he had last seen in the glass, that faceless shape with Ryan in hot pursuit through a train, the plunge to rushing waters below. Hour after hour, he crouched in his seat, apprehensive and alarmed for his life, not alone because of Ryan's pursuit, but because of the new upsurging of faith he now had in his glass, the telescope which had never really been his to own. Dawn came. The train paused at a way station in northern Wisconsin, presumably to take on water. McElwain peered from the window but could see nothing. Unfortunately for him, he was on the wrong side. On the far side of the locomotive, an airplane had discharged Detective Inspector Ryan, fresh from his talk, with a taxi driver who had taken McElwain to the station and had come in in response to the call. Ten minutes out of the way station, McElwain saw him coming down the aisle of the fur of the coach, he got up and made his way leisurely to the platform of his own coach. There he looked up ahead. Pine forest loomed on all sides, and at the moment the train was approaching the top of a ridge where there was an especially thick growth of trees. He could yet thwart the glass and his prophecy. At that moment, he looked back into his coach, and Ryan caught sight of him. He burst onto the next coach. By the time he had run its length, the train would be passing through the dense woods at the top of the ridge. He could leap out and take his chance, however close upon him Ryan might be. Through the coach, out to the further platform, a vaulting into the air, free of the train and Ryan. Unfortunately for McElwain's vanity, 
in his conviction that he would thwart the prophecy of his glass, the train at that moment passed over a deep gorge of scarcely 50 feet in width with a deep, rushing stream below. Instead of landing in the woods as he had hoped, McCowan went hurtling down. He thought in his last despairing moments that the face of the ancient owner of the telescope was looking up at him from the rocky, foaming water, rising so swiftly to meet him, his lips opening and closing to say over and over, Too late, my boy. Too late. Today's episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark is proudly brought to you by Raycon, makers of affordable premium wireless audio products that you'll love to use. Whether you're working from home or working on your fitness, you want what you're listening to to be what you're listening to, not what everyone around you is listening to. Everyone needs a great pair of wireless earbuds, but before you go dropping hundreds of dollars on a pair, you need to check out the wireless earbuds from Raycon. Raycon earbuds start at about half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds out on the market, and that they sound just as amazing as other top audio brands you know. And their newest model, the Everyday E25 earbuds, are their best ones yet. With an incredible six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, more bass, and a more compact design that gives you a nice noise isolating fit. Raycon wireless earbuds are so comfortable, they're ideal for any situation. They're perfect for everything from conference calls to binging your favorite podcasts. When it comes to quality, I wouldn't be caught dead using anything other than Raycon, and I'll tell you why. Tech shouldn't be designed in a vacuum, cold white rooms by people with degrees but with no use for their own products. That's what makes Raycon different from traditional electronic brands. You, my listeners, are at the center of their creative process and they focus on what you truly want. Raycon uses cutting edge technology to boost your daily routine with crystal clear sound. Pair that with soft comfort gel tip fittings and long-lasting battery life, and you can wear your new earbuds as long as you want. And they back their product with a year-long warranty and great customer service. Raycon's not just changing the game, they're reinventing it. Also, unlike some of your other wireless options, Raycon earbuds are both stylish and discreet with no dangling wires or stems to distract anyone during video calls. You may have heard through the grapevine about how the company was co-founded by hip-hop artist Ray J, or discovered it through celebrities like Snoop Dogg, Cardi B, and Melissa Etheridge, all of whom are obsessed with their Raycons. So, pick up a pair and see for yourself what the hype is all about. Now, it's the time to get the latest and greatest from Raycon. Get 15% off your order at buyraycon.com slash dark. That's buyraycon.com slash dark for 15% off Raycon wireless earbuds. Buyraycon.com slash dark. Be sure you visit that URL to let them know that Otis Gyre and Scary Stories Told in the Dark sent you. I hope you enjoyed McElwain's Glass by author August Derleth, as performed by yours truly. Up next, we've got a second terrifying tale for you, this one from author James Causey. In it, we'll discover the dark side of a seemingly innocent work of art with murderous intent in its pink marble heart. Without further ado, I present to you the statue... Jerome Winters pursed his lips. Young man, he said coldly, a bargain's a bargain. But can't you give me just a little more time? The young man's eyes were dark and pleading against the pallor of his face. Another two months. Another month. I could surely find some way. His voice trailed off. Winters was shaking his head from side to side, 
staring at him with his frosty blue eyes. Three months you were given, he said curtly. Seventy-five dollars. You've had time enough, my good man. Plenty of time. Seventy-five dollars with interest. And you don't have it, do you? His voice was faintly mocking. The young sculptor buried his face in his hands. No, he said hoarsely, I haven't. But I could surely scrape up the money some way, if only. Winters looked queerly at him. He stood up. He was a short, slight man, small and withered as an old permison, his blue eyes wearing a perpetually frosty gaze. In the little town of Hammondville, Winters was by far the wealthiest, as well as the most hated. His loans bordered upon usury, and those who could not pay were given no mercy. It caused more than one suicide and a very appreciable amount of misery and suffering. A wizened, dried-up little spider he was, who spun his web carefully, showing not the slightest pity to those unfortunate enough to fall into it. Just now, contrary to his usual satisfaction, when foreclosing a mortgage, he felt curiously frustrated. Perhaps he had not made enough profit this time. Young man, his voice was thin and sharp, three months ago you came to me with a desperate plea for money, on my terms. As security, I was given a small bit of sculpture, unfinished at that. His voice hardened. It is not my usual policy to be so generous. Generous? The young sculptor's face twisted. His voice was bitter. You speak of generosity? The Don Child, my, my statue? Seventy-five dollars? Finished? I could very easily sell that statue for... for some considerable sum, I suppose. Winter's words dripped cold. Remember, the statue's incomplete. I may have a hard time disposing of it, for that very reason. He frowned petulantly. The young man stared at Winters as if seeing him for the first time. Slowly, Winters flushed, and his eyes fell under that penetrating gaze. So, Deralt said softly, I might have known. He straightened, drew a deep breath, and looked at Winters again. It is absolutely useless to ask for more time, I see. Absolutely, Winters said, some of his poise returning to him. Then, two spots of color appeared in the young man's cheek. Then, sir, may I see the statue? May I? Just once since it is for the last time. There was no harm in letting him see it. Winter shrugged. Why not? He made his way toward the back of the study, where he opened the door to a closet. Deraults followed him slowly. In one corner of the closet stood a shapeless something on a pedestal, draped in a sheet. Your statue, young man. Winters turned sideways and lifted the sheet. In spite of himself, a small glint of appreciation came to his eyes as he looked at the statue. It was the nude figure of a child, exquisitely carved it was, in pink marble, life-size. The statue stood on tiptoe, a smile on its rosy face, a childish, contented smile, both arms stretching skyward to greet the sun. But the hands, they were unfinished. The fingers were crudely blocked out, rough like marble mittens. Evidently, some work was needed before the whole was completed. But even as it was, the statue was beautiful. Winters, in spite of himself, had to admit that. Unconsciously, his fingers caressed the marble in a possessive gesture. He turned to look at the young man. Deraults was standing there, leaning against the door jam, gazing at the statue intently. There was an odd expression on his face, a strained, rapt expression. But it is unfinished, he breathed. 
It is unfinished. Eh? said Winters sharply. Geralt started. He turned slowly and looked at Winters. He looked then at the statue, caressing it with his eyes. I put my soul into that statue, he murmured softly. A labor to produce a masterpiece. A work of art that would endure. He broke off. Winters, he said, his face strangely white, his voice suddenly hoarse. Could I finish the dawn, child? Her hands, they're incomplete. She would not like that. It's hard to reach for the sun when one's hands are ugly. Would it be possible? Even though the statue's yours now, I could do the work in this room here with chisel and hammer. His eyes held the quality of a prayer. His voice trembled. Could I finish it, sir? Winters looked at him, a faint streak of perversity, which, incidentally, was to cost him his life, rose in his brain. I see no reason why I should, he snapped. You have looked at the statue. It was enough that I should let you do so, quite enough. I expect to have the statue disposed of by the end of this week, unfinished as it is. Of course, the profit will be negligible, but... He spread his hands, indicative of his disinterest in the matter. Good day, sir. The Ralts turned slowly, ashen. Then, then you will not allow me to finish. He said almost childlike. Precisely. The young sculptor walked away slowly toward the door, his head bowed. At the threshold, he turned and looked first at Winters, then at the dawn child. There was an enigmatic expression on his face. Nevertheless, he whispered, The dawn child shall be finished. Soon. I asked you for but a week more, Winters. I'll give you a week now. He turned and walked stiffly out. Winters raised his eyebrows. It was perhaps thirty seconds later that he heard the crash. He hurried out of the house, his pale blue eyes curious behind the glasses. There was a rather large crowd clustered in the middle of the street, muttering excitedly. The truck stood by its fenders, rather badly dented, with a splotch of red. The truck driver was standing by, addressing empty air for the most part and telling how he just walked right out in the street in front of my truck. It wasn't my fault. Can't help it if a man walks out in the street in front of a truck and doesn't even look where he's going. He walked out. Winters pursed his thin lips. Then he turned back into his study where he made certain entries in a large black ledger. On impulse, he checked up upon Duralt's. The young sculptor had lived alone in a garret in the poorer section of town, and from what Winters could ascertain, seemed passionately devoted to his work. He was poor, very, indeed. Winters wondered how he had ever managed to keep body and soul together. It certainly was not his fault if the Waltz paid no attention to where he was walking while crossing the street. The remainder of the day, winter is spent in his usual pleasant fashion, that of figuring how to dispossess certain hapless clients. It was late that night, around 11.30, when Winters awoke suddenly with the conviction that someone, or something, was making strange sounds downstairs. He lay awake for some minutes, staring into the blackness, and suddenly he sat bolt upright in bed. The sound was repeated. It was an odd scraping and scratching noise. Muttering to himself, Winters got out of bed, put on his robe and slippers, and shuffled out into the hall. As near as he could determine, the sounds were coming from downstairs, in the general direction of his study. He shuffled downstairs and into the study, where he turned on the light. The glare of the light exploded whitely, throwing everything in the room into harsh relief. Black, ugly shadows, dark corners illuminated. There was nothing in the room. Winters grunted and reached again for the light switch. 
He froze. The sound had recommenced. It was distinctly audible, and it seemed to come from the closet. Winters went over and opened the closet door. Probably rats, he thought, peering through the darkness in the closet. No rats. Winters frowned and looked more carefully. There was no corner where a rat might hide. Winters looked at the statue standing there in the corner, and his breath hissed softly between his teeth. He distinctly remembered having draped a sheet over it before going to bed. But now the sheet lay on the floor. Well, then, rats could drag down sheets, large rats. Frowning, Winters picked up the sheet and stood staring at the statue before covering it. The general appearance of the statue changed. It was not quite right somehow. Winters shook his head angrily and went back to his room. Rats, no doubt. He was not the sort of man to be bothered by such occurrences. Perhaps half an hour after going to bed, he was roused again. The same sounds. Grating, rasping, scratching noises. Oddly muffled, they were. Coming from downstairs. Winters swore softly and tried to sleep. The next day, Winters examined the statue critically. There was, he observed, a peculiar quality to the dawn child's smile, an oddly unpleasant quality, and the arms of the statue did not look quite right. And the hands, Winters could see, were changed, as if someone had been working on them with a sculptor's chisel. He didn't bother to puzzle the matter out. Methodical and precise as ever, he cleaned up the shards of marble and went about his business for the day. Possibly some prankster, or his imagination, or it might be the rats. Gnawing, no matter. He would make sure. A substantial remainder of the morning he spent in setting rat traps in likely spots throughout the house. Later he would see about selling the statue. That afternoon, Winters called several dealers in antiques and objects d'art. There was, it seemed, little or no demand of unfinished statues. No, he could find no buyer anywhere. After the dozenth call, Winters hung up, disgusted, and sat immediately staring into space for several seconds. His thoughts were not pleasant. It was probably the first time in his life he had failed to come out a winner in a business transaction. The remainder of the afternoon, he brooded over it. Mentally, he kicked himself a dozen times for having failed to take advantage of the young sculptor's offer. He should have let the Ralts finish. Winter's brow furrowed. Had not the Ralts said something about, uh, about finishing the statue? But the Ralts was dead. Mentally, Winters kicked himself again. That night, before going to bed, Winters investigated the entire study thoroughly. Everything was in perfect order. The statue was covered, the closet was locked, the windows and the doors were all barred. Winters grunted in satisfaction and then went to bed. Three hours later, he was roused suddenly. He could hear nothing now save the faint echo of a somehow familiar sound seeming to echo in his ears. Possibly one of the rat traps going off, he decided in some satisfaction, and so deciding, turned over again on his side. Abruptly he raised himself on one elbow and glared through the darkness toward the hall. The sound had been repeated. He could hear it now, the same chipping sound. Winters cursed silently and got up, taking care not to creak the bed springs. Very stealthily, he tiptoed downstairs. He opened the study door silently and quite suddenly snapped on the light and stood on the threshold, blinking. There was no one in the room. Winters looked around. The closet door was still locked. Muttering querulously himself, he opened it and looked inside. For an instant, he wondered if his eyes were beginning to play tricks on him. Then he took a step backward. Statue's hands were beginning to take 
definitive form. Moreover, the arms had moved. Moved a good three inches. Winters rubbed his chin doubtfully and wondered how he could have ever thought the face of the statue beautiful. The lips were not smiling at all, and the whole face seemed to have a definitively unpleasant cast. Humph, said Winters. He retrieved the sheet and placed it upon the statue. He looked around the study carefully and into each corner of the closet, more than once narrowly escaping the sticking of his foot into a rat trap. Before going back to bed, he eyed the tiny pile of marble chips around the pedestal of the statue, and though his lips moved queerly, he said nothing. Jerome Winters got very little sleep that night. He heard the chirping, scraping sounds from downstairs quite audibly, no matter how hard he tried to bury his head underneath the covers. Next day, business did not go well at all. Every little thing seemed to go wrong. His papers were not where they should be, and he forgot several important matters relating to interest payments and debts. But he would not admit, even to himself, that he was worried. Toward noon, Winters received an unexpected telegram. He scowled at it and pursed his lips. This was decidedly unfortunate. He had planned to get rid of that statue today, to take it to some antique dealer and, well, give it away if he had to. What was he thinking of? Give something away that had cost him $75, and for that matter, Two sleepless nights. But after all, the Ralts had said that the statue would be finished within a week. And the look on the face of the statue last night, possibly there was something to the young sculptor's threat after all. Winters dismissed the thought. At any rate, he would be out of town for the next four days on business. A piece of property he had acquired from some poor debtor must be appraised. Well, he could get rid of the statue in the city, at some small profit, of course. It would be comparatively simple, since the statue was almost finished. So it was that while away from Hammondville, Winters saw and interviewed the manager of a certain prominent antique shop, one Sir Arthur Manwell, in regard to coming out to Hammondville to see a very valuable statue he possessed. Yes, the statue was easily worth Five hundred dollars, exquisitely carved it was, by a young sculptor named Duraltz. What? Oh, no, the young man had met with a very tragic accident. Yes, too bad. And he would come out to Hammondville today to appraise the statue? What? Oh, not until tomorrow. But the week would be up then. What? Oh, oh nothing. Nothing at all. Tomorrow, then. Winters arrived home that afternoon with a curious feeling of mingled relief and apprehension. The very first thing he did was to open the closet door. There was absolutely no doubt about it this time. The arms of the statue had moved downward to an almost horizontal position. The hands, they were nearly completed, but they had changed. The fingers were bent as if to grasp something. They looked like small pink claws. The marble dust, Winters saw, was thick about the base of the statue. One foot was poised, with knee lifted high, as though the statue were about to step off the pedestal. Winters slowly raised his eyes and looked at the face. It was twisted in a rather frightful leer. Winters shut the closet door and leaned weakly against it, He locked it carefully and walked out of the study, mopping his damp face with a handkerchief. His mouth was strangely dry, and his face was pale. Tomorrow would be the seventh day. Late that night, he heard the now familiar chirping of stone. The noise this time was fast and furious, almost eager. Winters did not get out of bed. He knew it would be of no use. After a little while, the sound ceased. The statue, then, was finished. Winters did not venture downstairs next morning until almost noon. 
When he did, he stayed as far as possible from his study. In an agony of dread and apprehension, he awaited for the arrival of Sir Arthur from the city. Sir Arthur did not come. By mid-afternoon, Winters was almost frantic. Finally, he tiptoed into his study. There was a telephone on his desk. He swiftly dialed the operator and, staring fixedly at the closet door, waited for his call to be put through. Sir Arthur Manwell, dealer in antiques and object darts, answered. Yes, he was sorry. He was desolated, but he had not been able to keep the appointment. No, he would not be able to come down to make the appraisal until tomorrow, sometime in the morning. What? What was the matter? But it was impossible. An important matter had come up. He had to remain at the shop, and... Well, I don't care. Winter shrieked into the mouthpiece, suddenly panic-stricken. You've got to come down. Today you're here. I've got the damn thing locked up in the closet, but the week's up, I tell you. The week's up. Sir Arthur informed him politely and frigidly that he would arrive tomorrow morning. But the statue, shrilled Winters, the statue. There was the audible click of the man hanging up. Operator, operator, Winters dialed frantically. Abruptly, he froze. Behind him, the sound of a splintering wood, a door smashing, a closet door. Involuntarily, Winters dropped the receiver on its hook and, trembling, stared straight ahead. A soft thud of something striking the carpet. Then the quick pattering of footsteps across the floor. Winters worked his mouth convulsively, but before he could scream, he was seized by the throat. Like Winters, Sir Arthur Manwell was a very punctilious man. So it was that he arrived in Hammondville early the next day to see Winters on the matter of the statue. It so happened that when he arrived, there was a rather large crowd of people clustered about Winters' house. Managing to get in, he saw the police in the corner probing about Winters' study. Winters had been found in his overturned chair, and the studio in his immediate vicinity was somewhat messy. His head had been almost torn from his body. Indeed, the coroner was quite puzzled. Strangled, he murmured gravely. Um, handprints like those of a small ape, or possibly those of a child. Manuel was extremely shocked. Yes, he explained. I came out here to see the poor chap about a statue he intended to sell. Any idea how it happened? The coroner had no idea. As he turned to leave, Maxwell caught sight of the closet door at the back of the room. The lock was ripped away and the door hung loose on its hinges. Manuel frowned, puzzled. When does mention the closet? He murmured under his breath. On sudden impulse, Manuel looked round to see if he were being observed. Everyone's interest was focused on what lay in the center of the room. Manuel went slowly to the closet door. He opened it. He drew a slow, deep breath of awe. Superb! The dawn child stood on tiptoe, both arms stretching high, its face smiling in contentment. Manuel looked at it for a long minute. Quite suddenly, he stiffened. He glanced back towards... Where Winters lay, he looked again at the statue. Then, his face very white, and his hands shaking, he shut the closet door softly. His lips were a jagged thin line as he strode slowly outside. He recalled again the words of the coroner. Very tiny handprints. He remembered Winters' frantic shrieking over the phone and on the soft pink of the statue's hands, he had seen a deeper, more ominous stain of red. (laughs) 
I hope you enjoyed the statue by author James Causey, as performed by yours truly. As a reminder, all of tonight's tales were drawn from the January 1943 edition of the legendary pulp fiction magazine Weird Tales. I hope you'll agree that even though nearly 100 years have passed since these spooky tales were first published, that some things never change and that they're just as chilling as ever. Thanks for listening as I breathe new life into these classics. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcast and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jivey Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and add free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs>